Hi, welcome back to our channel. This week, we're going to show you our new 20-foot Life Intense Timberline Exchange Bell Tent and talk about a few things we've learned over the last few weeks. asked by the Life and Tents company to test out their new Timberline Exchange bell tent and we were thrilled. You know we've got 50 acres of beautiful woodland out here and we were developing some guest sites that we thought the Timberline Exchange would be absolutely perfect for. So whether you're thinking about a she shed, a man cave, a guest house, or even a couple's retreat, this tent can serve the purpose. We've been testing it for a few weeks now, looking at the durability, the ease of cleaning, and before we go inside, I'm gonna hand it over to Sean to talk a little bit about the importance of siting and setting it up right. In real estate, they say location, location, location. Well, the same thing with this tent. I wanted good airflow and some exposure of the sun to make sure we could keep it dry because we're a very human environment. So first off, we are on the top of a ridge line in a very mature forest, and so I cleared out the canopy just above the tent. Now directly south of the tent, I have an opening in the canopy to allow direct sunlight for several hours in the afternoon to make sure it dries out well. Also to the east, I have some morning sunlight, and we get some broken sunlight in the afternoon too. So all sides of that tent will see sunlight during the most humid and rainy months of the year. By the way, if you have any type of tree cover around this tent, I would highly recommend the fly cover because you will have bird droppings, you'll have leaves and sticks that are gonna fall out of those trees and you really need to protect that canvas. When you start with one of these tents, you wanna start from the ground up. Now, there is the option of putting a deck down and that's what we were initially going to do. But we thought of several things. First of all, time, cost, and is this really the site that's perfect for this tent? If you're really not sure that's where it's gonna go, you might wanna consider putting directly on the ground first and then building a deck later, and that's what we decided to do. So first, we cleared and graded the area to make sure the natural water flow wasn't interrupted and that water would flow away from the tent. And that clearing had to be a relatively big area, and we'll talk about that later. Next, we brought in about seven tons of rock. Now, there were two types of rock we brought in. First of all, we started with a CA6 gravel. It's, you find it on your driveways. Nice angled rock because angled rock basically stays in place. It's very, very stable. But on top of that, we did a very fine ag line. Uh, you can use turkey grit. There's different things. It's a very, very finely crushed rock, or you could say a very, very coarsely crushed sand. But the great thing about that is it packs really, really nice and gives you a very, very flat floor because when you walk in there, you don't want to be stepping on rocks because you'll feel what's underneath the tarp uh, through that. So you don't want to feel these and you don't when you're walking on this. The other thing is because it packs so nice, it's hard, it doesn't dimple when you walk. So that area in there, the floor, you can sweep it really nice because it stays flat all the time. Now we also got the tarp footprint that goes underneath the tent. I think that's very important too. It can keep water from coming up from below the tent. It also is a, is a second barrier between that ag lime and the floor and then your, your feet. So it's very comfortable to walk inside there. So let's take a look at how we fasten this to the ground so it's secure in heavy winds and weather. You notice the actual tarp is not secured to the ground and it has these loops, but in the directions it says you really just need to fasten the tent itself and it will hold the tarp down. So these stakes are important, but these do not need to be secured. Every loop on the bottom of the tent has one of these stakes and these stakes don't hold any weight or anything. So these 
small uh, aluminum ones that they supplied are just fine, except for right here at the door. At the door, there's a lot of pressure from zipping and unzipping the door that kind of causes these to work out, mainly because right below this, I've got about six inches of gravel and an ag line on top. There's nothing really for this stake to grab into. So I'm going to replace that with a, a large rebar stake that I've fabricated back at the barn. Now, when you're considering the guy wires themselves, you really have to clear a much bigger area than the footprint of your tent. When we graded this area, you can see we had to cut some of this out. So the elevation of this stake is higher than the tent floor, which means it's within about six feet of the tent to maintain the 15 degree angle that they want. But if you look at flat ground, some of my stakes are up to nine feet away from the tent. Now you put nine feet on both sides, that's 18 feet plus a 20 foot uh, diameter, and you've got 38 feet that you need to clear. These are nicely designed because they have adjustable brackets right here. But as you can see on this side, it's not installed quite the way it should have been. We want these brackets adjustable, but right now I'm adjusted all the way to the tight side. And that's because that stake is closer than normal. Ideally, you want it attached like this one right here with plenty of room to move this in or out so I can make the proper adjustments to get these stable. Initially, when you set the tent up, that center pole needs to be straight, and that's the starting point you're going to go with. Once you get that straight, you're going to come back outside, and you can use these poles to make sure they're straight up and down, not angled one side or the other. Once you get it all tightened, go back inside, make sure that center pole is still straight, and you're good to go. If you get the fly cover, which we highly recommend, especially in a very wet environment like we are, you're going to have two sets of these. So you're going to adjust one, and I go all the way around and do those. Those are attached to the tent poles themselves, and then I go in and I do the fly separately. We've had the tent up for two weeks now, and uh, it's time for a review. We've had a couple of nights. We have a two nights that we had thunderstorms, and Danielle and I were in there. And uh, quite honestly, it's the first time I've ever camped through thunderstorms and not been worried about the integrity of the tent. The tent hardly moved at all, just the flaps, but it was very, very stable. And quite honestly, between the thunder and the lightning, which woke us up, the rain on the canvas actually lulled us right back to sleep. So it was very comfortable through those storms. Now, last night, unfortunately, it was severe thunderstorms and tornadoes expected. So we actually went back to the house, but my fault, not my wife's fault, I left the door completely open, obviously just the screen, but I left the flaps open. I was really worried about water intrusion in there because we got seven inches of rain last night. That's right, we got seven inches of rain. That's why I have muck boots on because just to get to the site, we had to do a creek crossing. So it was a pretty bad storm. And I would say there's probably a tablespoon, you heard that right, a tablespoon of water just inside the door. So unbelievably with this, uh, just the screen on the front, uh, only a slight bit of water got on the inside. That's that's pretty darn impressive. As you can see, it's sagging a little bit. It's probably time to go ahead and tighten up the guy lines around the outside, and uh, I am happy so far. So the manual does an excellent job of telling you what to do weekly or monthly or annually, and you really need to read that because there are steps you need to do. So after five weeks and several thunderstorms and about 15 inches of rain, we've noticed a few things. So let's point those out. First of all, when the winds get really heavy and the ground gets super soft, these stakes can begin to work themselves out. That's why it's important to put them in at a 45 degree angle. But you may have to go in and put those in, and I'm guessing the same is gonna happen in a freeze and thaw cycle where the ground is going to allow those to work out. So keep an eye on your stakes. Secondly, when we built this, I actually took a pickaxe and I put a trench around here to make sure that any water coming off the tent would flow around. And it seems to be working. It's, it's a nice little swale right there. We are not getting water inside there. But as you come over here, you'll notice we built the pad bigger than the footprint because we knew there would be a drip line off the tent. This shows you that drip line. It's about 12 inches from the base of the tent out to here is where the drip line is. 
and you're going to get some erosion there. You want to make sure that that water can flow away from the tent. And a way to check that is when it's raining really hard, you just go outside with a flashlight and you make sure that the water is flowing away. And if not, you're going to have to basically build another trench out there. But uh, be careful of that drip line. It's going to erode and it's going to expose the gravel underneath or possibly even the dirt. And you don't want that because it's going to splash against the tent. When we first built this pad, the ag lime and the gravel we put down is very dusty and it takes a few rains to get that dust out of it. And also the ground itself, because it was exposed, was very dusty. So it took a few rains and during those rains we got some splattering on the side of the tent, but it wipes off really easy. But you want to periodically check that and clean it off to make sure that tent stays clean. This thing has been phenomenal. We have really tried it out for the last five weeks and kind of put it through the ringer. I'm going to mention as we go in, first and foremost, use rugs, lots of rugs. We have rugs here uh, at the entry in addition to the gravel pad. This is to help prevent dirt, leaves, sticks, debris from being carried in on shoes. So this is critical. Now this one is one of the coarser straw type mats uh, so you can you know, wipe your shoes on it. But where we live, there are a large number of poisonous snakes and spiders and whatnot that may actually go into your shoe to hide. So we don't wanna recommend leaving shoes outside. So for that reason, I also have a rug just inside the doors. Just kind of unzip this so we can walk inside. But you can see this is just a nice little rug to step on initially. It collects the dust and the debris from your shoes and then we slip the shoes off and just place them by the door. Pretty basic, but goes a long way to helping with maintenance. So once inside, rugs, rugs, rugs. You know, protecting the floor is really my number one priority. We've already got the ag line base to smooth things out. We've got the footprint tarp to help protect it but the floor is still going to take a lot of abuse. So I went and just purchased a coordinating set of pretty basic rugs. These are actually indoor outdoor rugs, so they can be cleaned pretty easily. And then to save a little money, I just repurposed an old quilt I had. Uh, it kind of coordinates with the blue theme and any furniture that could potentially shift around has something underneath it. So for, obviously that's gonna be used a lot we have the rug under that. I'm sorry, the, we have the quilt under that. And the quilt also takes care of a couple of the legs on these tables. So for our bell tent purposes, uh, we also added a recliner that was on the recommendation of our very first visitor. He said, you know, one thing I love to do in the evening is just sit in a comfortable chair and read a book by a lamplight. So we went and at a discount store for 15 bucks, I picked up a really nice Lazy Boy recliner in perfect condition. Um, we got a rug for that, again, to protect the floor. And then I used some scrap wood from our barn to build these uh, side tables that you see in here. Because the legs of the side table sometimes hang off the rugs, for anything like that, I used the furniture um, pads to go underneath the feet of these tables and the chest, and that way there's still a nice soft barrier there to protect that floor. And we actively used it uh, daily for about the first four weeks. For the last week, we kind of left it sitting, which tends to happen in life, and I was really curious what we would find when we came back out. Now, when we left it, we actually left the, the wall windows, um, the flaps down, so it's protected by the screen, but we allowed that for ventilation so air could circulate. We did close up the front flaps, um, but I came out here just now and I wanted to check on how the fabrics were holding up. There is a very, very small amount of mildew that has built up just very light, uh, almost undetectable but it's built up right on the top of these flaps and that's all the way around. So that's something I'm gonna have to clean. The other thing I noticed is all my sheets, my comforter, my fabrics held up just fine, but the pillows on the inside have all developed some mildew as you can see here. So we're gonna have to take these in, clean up what we can, may have to replace them. Um, but that's good to know for the future. There's going to be certain things you don't want to leave out here if you're not actively staying in. 
I'm going to show you a look in this cedar trunk we have. Uh, for the most part, this is not used by guests, but I have found it to be an excellent tool to store the linens so I'm not constantly coming back and forth from the house. Now, right now, I'm doing an experiment. So this pillow is actually um, a pillow I don't need. It's a spare that I'm going to experiment and see if we have the mildew problem if it's stored inside the trunk. I'll let you know the results of that in a couple of months. But otherwise, we're also experimenting. Uh, you can see in here, I've got the same exact sheets stored outside in the cedar trunk, and I've also got some stored in plastic here in the trunk. So again, in a couple of months, we're gonna see how those fare and let you know the results of the best way to store here in this humid environment. So while we're also talking about maintenance of the tent, when I come in and prepare this for guests, one of the big things I found handy is to have a small dust broom and dust pan. Uh, I just keep that in here both for myself, for general cleaning and for guests to use during their stay. But when I'm doing the in-between, I bring a large broom, a long handle, so that I can actually hit the top of the tent here. Because one thing I found is that bugs tend to climb up in between the roof of the tent and the fly cover. And so you'll kind of see uh, around here in the shadows, you'll see, you know, moths or other things that just start to build up in there. So if I just beat that out about once a week, it tends to keep that a lot cleaner and more pleasant to stay in. So, in the last few weeks, you know, we found that uh, the basic maintenance is really pretty simple. Almost like you'd maintain any room in your house. A little sweeping, a little wiping down, no big deal. Stay tuned though, and we'll be back in a few months to tell you more about the long-term maintenance that's involved. Hey, thanks for watching as always. Be sure you subscribe. This particular review of this Life Intense Bell Tent is a little different because it is a long-term testing. In other words, we're going to be going through at least four seasons throughout the year. We've gone through the end of summer, we're getting into fall, and we're really curious to see how it holds up through the Southern Illinois ice storms, snow storms, the spring rains. All of this will affect the maintenance and use of this tent. So we will be following up every few months and letting you know what we find the upsides, the downsides, as always, we'll be giving you honest reviews and information so that you can make an educated decision. Leave us a comment. Let us know if this is something you might find useful on your property. And otherwise, we'll see you next time.